All right, thanks. So yesterday we talked at the end of lecture about contextual equivalence or observational equivalence, and then I promised you that today we'd uh, set up a logical relation for reasoning about equivalence of programs in System X. All right, so let's dive in. That's what we're going to do. Um, so our definition, um, our specification of System F is up there on the board, the syntax operational semantics, static semantics. Um, let's uh, start to set up a logical relation for this. So now remember, this is going to be a binary logical relation. We're going to talk about when two terms are related at a certain type. So when we write down um, our value interpretation of types, well, more generally, when we write down our value interpretation of types, we are going to say that two values, v1 and v2, belong to this interpretation. And Basically, what we have in mind is that these two should be somehow equivalent, all right? And we are building these value interpretations with the um, expectation that V1 and V2 both have this uh, type tau, all right? And V1, V2 will be closed terms just as they have been before. All right, so when are two values related at the type bool? when they are both true or both false, right? They have to be equal. Or I could write this as V1 and V2 belong to bool if uh, V1 equals V2 equals true or they both equal each other equals false, right? Okay, um, all right. Uh, when can we say that two um, functions to lambda terms are related at the type tau1 arrow tau2. Now think of this as, you know, we want these two functions to be equivalent. So when is lambda x colon tau1 dot e1 equivalent? I'll sometimes say related, but to, for now I mean equivalent, obviously. Um, so let me actually change this to tau arrow tau prime, just so I don't get my ones and twos confused, right? I'm going to use one for the left-hand side term and twos for the, left, uh, for the right-hand side. So let's call this a tau arrow tau prime. This is a lambda x tau dot e1 and lambda x tau dot e2. But I have an E1 and an E2. OK, so do I want one value or two? I have two functions. So clearly, we want to do something here with E1 with something for x. And we want to say how that is related to E2 with something for x. Right? These are the things that we're going to want to relate at the result type tau prime. What do we want to relate there? Do we want to apply these functions to? Related. Related. Yeah, we want to say, did you say same? OK, so um, related is more general, right? Um, it's, it's like saying, if you say the same value, then that restricts you. I mean, first of all, the setup won't work very well. But also, it restricts you to, to setting up a definition that is um, weaker in some sense, right? It's letting you reason about equivalence of functions only when they're applied to syntactically identical values, right? You want to be able to say, oh, no, I can be much more liberal than that. If you just give me two equivalent values, they don't have to be syntactically identical, then I will give you relative results, okay? So here, what we want to say is if you give me a V1 and a V2 that I know are equivalent in my logical relation at the argument type, so give me two related values of the argument type tau. And I will do the substitution, e1 with v1 for x. e2 gets applied to the other term, v2. Um, and those terms will be related at the result type tau prime. OK? There's a slogan again for logical relations. If you give me related inputs, I will give you related outputs. OK? Logical relations take related inputs to related outputs. All right. Um, was this up? All right. So, so far we were in relatively familiar territories. Everything, we just have two of everything now instead of one, right? We have a relation instead of a set. Um, now, let's, um, we're giving interpretation of types. What's the next type up there in the grammar? Alpha. 
alpha. Okay, should we give an interpretation to alpha? Hmm, I didn't yesterday. Someone asked me explicitly when we were doing recursive types. I said, nah, we'll, we'll stick to this. We'll close off our alphas carefully. We'll always only interpret closed types. So maybe we don't need to give, a, a, give an interpretation for alpha. Let's just see what happens. Maybe we will only give interpretations to closed terms, to closed types. That's what I seem to be doing so far, right? Let's push forward and see if, if this works. OK, so we definitely need to give an interpretation for the polymorphic type for all alpha tau. So when are two terms, values, sorry, when are two values related as a type for all alpha tau? What form do they have to have, first of all? Big lambda alpha. OK, so lambda alpha E1 and lambda alpha E2. We want to say that these are related at the type for all alpha tau if what? So again, when you're setting up the value interpretations, you want to think about how do I use a value of this type? What does the elim form do? So let's go look. What is the elim form? It's type application. And the operational semantics is that line right up there, that last line. We take a lambda alpha e, and we apply it to a type. Right? OK. But what are related types? OK, hold on one second, actually. I want to show. Um, I, had a, I had an example up on the board yesterday. Uh, remember the constant function? We had a free theorem up here. I just want to put that up again. Um, we had that if you have a closed term E of type for all alpha, alpha arrow bool, right? We talked about the fact that this must be a constant function. Um, then if you give me uh, two separate types, a tau 1 and a closed tau 2, and any arbitrary value, v1 of type tau 1 and some v2 of type tau 2, then we said that it must be the case that E applied to tau 1 v1 must be equivalent. And yesterday we wrote contextually equivalent, but by the end of the lecture I said, well, we're, at, we're actually going to set up a logical relation. So now think of this as logically related. So E with tau 2 v2 at the type bool. We said that today we want to set up a logical relation which lets us prove that equivalence. OK, the reason I put that up is because I want to remind you that we want the ability to be able to apply our, um, to any lambda term to two different types on the two different sides. So that's just to say that you know we don't just want to pick one type here. We want to pick two types. Um, and then back to the, the last issue, do we want to pick two related types? What does it mean for types to be related? Can you just pick one type? Hmm? Can you just one type? No. I don't want to pick one type. I could. But I don't want to because I want to be able to prove that theorem. And I won't be able to prove that theorem if I restrict myself to putting only, you know, to applying my E, E is to only one type. So we want to be able to take a polymorphic function take something like these lambda alpha e's and apply them to two separate types on the two separate sides. Here? Yeah, there's no relation. They're completely arbitrary, right? That's why I explicitly wanted to spell that out. That free theorem says, give me two arbitrary types, tau 1 and tau 2. <coughs> OK, so let's, let's try to do that. Yeah. We can see that it will remain the same? In, uh, in that in case. Sense, yeah. yeah. Um, OK. This is related to something that's about to happen. All right, so let's do this. So let's just say let's pick two separate types, tau 1 and tau 2. They're not related, and we'll sort of draw our inspiration from that free theorem. Maybe they don't need to be related. Um, so we'll say for all tau 1, for any tau 1 and any tau 2 that you might give me, for all tau 1, tau 2, when I take my lambdas and apply them to these types, so let's just do the type application, E1 with tau 1 for alpha, and E2 with tau 2 for alpha, are going to be related at the result type. What is the result type? Tau 1, 
How? What does it look like? What's, what's the type of this? You might want to consult with the type application rule up. So the type of this term is E1, E1 with tau1 for alpha is? Tau with? Tau1 for alpha. And what's the type of this? With? Hmm. So they don't have the same type. OK. So what do I put here? What do I put here? I can't put this. I, I can't put. I can't just leave it as. Um, OK, so first, I can't put tau on there. The other one of the terms will be ill-typed. I can't put a tau through there. The other term will be ill-typed. Um, well, um, what if I leave it? What just happened? It has a free variable in it. So we have to do something about the free variable, right? We have to somehow remember that that free type variable alpha got substituted um, by a tau1 on the left, in the left term, and a tau2 in the right term, right? OK, so maybe we can use a trick. We can use a relational substitution. Let's call rho, and I'll stick rows everywhere. But basically, I want to say that alpha maps to two types, tau1 on the left, tau2 on the right. I just want to add this extra parameter rho to my entire logical relation. Let's call this a relational substitution. And its job is to remember, for type variables, what type did you pick for, the uh, for alpha on the left, and what type did you pick for alpha on the right? OK? Fair enough? All right, so um, in general, rho will have the form you know, alpha, map, alpha 1 maps to tau 1 1, tau 1 2, et cetera, so on, the finite. It's just a substitution, only it's keeping two things for every alpha, because we have bi a binary relation. Now. So I'm going to take our entire logical relation and parametrize it with this relational substitution that we are now going to carry around everywhere. And the reason we have to do it is because when we get to the polymorphic type, we don't know what type to put there for the alpha. right? And so we have to leave the alpha free and remember it on the outside. Think of it as a little trick for a minute, right? And we'll come back or refine it. OK, so there. Everything has rows on it. They just get carried around everywhere. The um, for all alpha tau case is where we are supposed to pick types. And obviously, here is where we would extend this relational substitution. People happy so far? OK, what's my next problem then? What am I doing now? I'm interpreting. Types which have <coughs> free, variables. free variables. Is that a question? Yeah. yeah. I don't understand why this is like this. So in the, in the substitute, it requires a new one, new two, new related. Uh -huh. But here, we don't have a similar term in the whole substitute. Uh, yes, we don't. Um, so and that's OK, because the, the whole point of polymorphism is, you know, as I've been sort of intuitively trying to suggest, um, that um, when, when something has a polymorphic type, it's really saying you can pick your type. And I promise to treat whatever values you give me of that type as a blob. So relatedness is not essential. OK? And that's a similar question for something plus. Like, is that the same thing? Or like, why, why don't we need to allow for the two variable names to be different? The two variable names to be different. Um, I assume whenever we, you know, we've been developing these logical relations, I've always assumed that you can just do alpha renaming um, and everything should kind of work out. Uh, you, just putting down the same variable name on both sides just makes certain things easier to state without having to worry about that. So, yeah. yeah. You also just say that all types are related? Two, any two types are related? Any two types are related, yes. The word related in the case of type, in the case of values, we're very careful about what values are related, right? Because we want this notion of equivalence between terms. That's what we're after. Um, but in the case of types, we could say that any two types are related. It's equivalent to saying that types don't need to be related, it's, right? OK. Um, all right. So now we are interpreting types with free variables in them. So remember when we crossed out this case? Well, we're going to have to go back to it. 
we do need to say when, what is the interpretation of a type alpha. But fortunately, now we're carrying around this relational substitution row, right? So now can you tell me when are two values, b1 and b2, going to be related at the type alpha? I mean, we know that. So whenever I write rho here, my assumption is that rho will always give me bindings for all of the free type variables in the type that sits here. All right? So whenever we are writing v tau rho, we are going to carefully set up the rest of the logical relation so that the domain of rho um, contains all of the free type variables of the type that we are interpreting. OK? So I point that out because that means that rho has a binding for alpha. Right? So here I can even tell you that it will be something like a tau 1, tau 2. But then what? How do I know when a v1 and a v2 are related at the type alpha? of a trick question because right now we don't. <laughs> what yes, Ben. Well I guess we just try to say we need to set tau one and tau two are equal and then V one and V two have been evaluated into that form. Ah, but I don't want them to be equal. That's the whole thing. Okay, so let's go back to this this example. Um when I try to reason about these two programs being equivalent at the type rule, what am I doing? I'm taking a polymorphic term, it's the same E on both sides, but then I am applying tau 1 and tau 2 for, um, you know, plugging in tau 1 and tau 2 for this alpha. So alpha is being instantiated to different types. And then I am, and then I'm sort of considering this function type, right? The function wants an argument of type alpha, and what am I providing? I'm providing a v1 on one side and a v2 on the other. So v1 on one side, v2 on the other, I am saying that they are related at the argument type alpha. And the way that I do this is right here. When we pick a tau 1 and a tau 2, to which we're going to apply our polymorphic uh, functions, we are also going to pick a relation on values of those two types. OK? So let me spell it out first, and then we'll. Um, I'm going to say that I get to pick two types for the two sides to syntactically substitute, and I get to pick a relation. This relation must be, be I'll write it as R is in rel of tau 1, tau 2. And let's see what that means. Rel of tau 1, tau 2 is going to be all relations R um, that contain, that are essentially drawn from the power set of value cross value. So they're just pairs of values. Um, the relation contains pairs of values such that for all v1, v2 in R, they are well typed. They are closed values. V1 has this type tau 1, and V2 has the type tau 2. It's not saying much, right? It's just saying R is a relation. It'll, have, it'll tell you what values are related. The only requirement is that the values on the left better be of type tau 1, because I just pick, picked a tau 1 for this side. And the values on the right better be of type tau 2, because I just picked a tau 2 on that side. And then, yes, Adam? Yep. And the earlier lectures on type theory, the concept of incompressitive features came up, and yep. it might have been unclear why such things were useful. If this is an incredibly quantification, which means you can't write this directly, I think it adds our internal. OK. Yeah. And actually, that's a good point. I, I have forgotten to mention yesterday that system F um, is, um, th in system F, we have impredicative polymorphism. And in particular, what that means is that right here, when we um, do type application, or rather there, when we take E and apply it to a tau prime, notice how that tau prime can be anything. That tau prime can be the type for all alpha tau itself, which is the type of the term, 
or it can be for all alpha tau, arrow for all alpha tau. It can be bigger than the type of the polymorphic function that it's you know, being fed into, so to speak. All right? That is impredicate of polymorphism. You can take a polymorphic function and apply it to a type that is bigger than the type of the function itself. Predicate of polymorphism is where you have a restriction, you must apply it to something smaller. All right? Okay, so coming back to this issue, we are saying, all right, so to reason about the relatedness of these polymorphic functions, I pick types for the two sides. I, I get to pick what values must be considered related now. I pick type alpha. All right? And then it must be the case that E1 with tau1 for alpha and E2 with tau2 for alpha are related at the type tau, but with rho extended so that I remember that I have tau1 on the left uh, substituted for alpha tau2 on the right, and I must carry around this relation that just got picked, so to speak. Okay? So these rows are now matching, mapping alphas to the types that we pick for the two sides, but also a relation on values of those types. What does that mean? That means that right here, I have a relation, right? So when I ask the question, when I get to this part of the definition and I say, when are two values related to the type alpha? Well, we just go and ask the relation if those two values are related, at the, should be considered related at that type, okay? So, um, this is a verbose way of writing it, but uh, right. Now, before we go on, let me just define some shorthand. Um, rho is now the triple, right? I mean, it's a it's a substitution, but it's mapping alphas to triples. I need a little bit of shorthand. So, whenever we have uh, a row that is, uh, you know, some alpha one mapped to tau one, one tau one, two, and some r one, and then, you know, we'll have alpha two mapped to something. Um, I'm going to write row one to mean the type substitution that contains the types on the left. Okay, I'm going to write row two to mean this tau one, two that's over there. Alpha one maps to tau one, two, the second thing. And I'm going to write rho sub r to mean extract the relations, okay? So this is going to be alpha maps to, alpha one maps to r one, alpha two maps to whatever it maps to. And there we go, all right? Just gonna make our lives easier. So just project out, you know, keep it a substitution, but ignore the other things in the triple. All right, so, that was just to say that we can write this in a much more succinct manner, right? What are the values that are related at the type alpha? Well, go into row alpha. I'm just going to erase this. It's rho sub r alpha, right? That gives us the relation. The relation contains the related values. Those are the values that should be considered related at alpha. OK? Yes, just a short hand. Identical. Okay. Um, all right. So, this is where the power of um, polymorphism of system F comes in. The parametricity. Right? I mean, we've been hand waving and saying, hey, it, this function promises to treat this alpha in an abstract manner. That's a really powerful principle. It says that. You get to pick your types for the alphas. You get to pick your notion of what is related. The logical relation just has to sort of, you know, respect that relation as your program runs in a sense. All right? And we'll see what that means when we try to do a proof of a free theorem. Okay. So um, let's finish this off. Um, we have to define when terms are related at the type tau. So a term E1 and E2 are related. Uh, by the way, all of these values and terms that, are, that I'm putting in here are well typed, just to reinforce that. Um, so there should be a requirement here that you know, these are well typed closed values and well typed closed terms of the appropriate type. Oh, by the way, what is the appropriate type now? I need to edit this a little. So 
we now are interpreting um, types with free variables in them. So notice how I said here this is a lambda x colon tau dot e1. That's not true anymore. That should not be a tau. It should be a row 1 applied to tau, because tau might have alpha free in it. We need to go ask rho, what is, how do we close that off, right? Because this value has to be closed. So it's going to be rho 1 of tau. And on the other side, we're going to need a lambda x rho 2 of tau, for instance. So in general now, we have what I haven't written up, but what we do have is that whenever we have v1 and v2 in that relation, it is the case that these are closed values of the type. v1 is of type rho 1 of tau, and v2 is of type rho 2 of tau. And then whatever other piece. OK? All right. OK. So when are these two expressions, the first one has type rho 1 tau, the second one has type rho 2 tau, um, they're closed. When are they related at this type? I want to consider them related if, OK, so by the way, this is system f. Everything's terminating. Okay, so we don't have to sort of worry about non-termination. We'll just set this up so that um, you know we, we acknowledge the fact that it is terminating. All right, so um, I want to consider E1 and E2 related if I run them, and when they terminate, I get to values V1 and V2, if the values are related. You want to find out if two terms are related? Please run them and check if the values are related, OK? That's, that's it. It's an operational kind of thing. All right, so we're going to say um, there exists a v1 and a v2. So I'm going to erase this such that e1 runs to v1, e2 runs to v2, and v1, v2 are related in the value interpretation of the type tau at rho. OK? There's no step indexing because I, I took recursive types out. I wanted to do this in a simpler setting. Right? But we could, tomorrow I'll show you quickly how we take a binary logical relation and add recursive types back in, what changes. All right, so um, now we still need to give an interpretation for open terms, right? The, the logical relation for open terms like we've been doing. So we will, this time we will, we will need to do um, two things. We'll need to give um, an interpretation for deltas. And we'll need to give an interpretation for gammas, right? Because we have two environments that we need to interpret. We need an interpretation for the type variables in delta so that we can close off the type variables of our term. And we need an interpretation for the um, term variables in gamma so that we can close off the term variables in E, right? OK, so uh, let's kind of do this inductively again. So for an empty delta, um, so mind you, what am I picking? I'm picking rows, right? Rows are the things that map type variables to something. That's going to be the interpretation of this. So in, if I don't have any type variables, I'm good with an empty row. Um, however, if I have to interpret delta comma alpha, then that means that I need a row, which is extended with a mapping for alpha, which will be to a type tau 1, tau 2, and a relation r. But it, what we need is, well, first we need row to belong to d of delta. And second, we need to make sure that r here belongs to rel of tau 1, tau 2. If r does not belong to rel of tau 1, tau 2, then that is not a well-formed triple for our purposes. All right? So we're very carefully going to make sure that this r belongs to rel of tau 1, tau 2. So that makes sure that we never, ever um, use a row or even, um, like rows will always have this property that this triple makes sense in the sense that R is about the two types that it's sitting next to. Is it rel on those? Okay, so uh, how about uh, G? G of empty, just an empty substitution gamma. Um, 
interpretation of the extended environment. By the way, is this tau that's sitting over here, is that going to have free type variables in it? That is our judgment form. Remember yesterday I said that um, our typing rules are set up to make sure that the free type variables of tau appear in delta and the free type variables in the range of gamma appear in delta. So gamma does have types with free type variables in it. They just better be in delta. So what does that mean? That means that when I'm trying to give an interpretation of this environment, these tau's might have free type variables. That means I need a row here to tell me what to map those type variables to. Okay, and in fact, I needed one here too. Um, okay, so now we're just gonna say that uh, the interpretation of this extended environment is going to be a gamma substitution. This time we're going to take type variables and map them to pairs of values because we have a relational, um, a binary relation, basically. So we, um, our gamma substitutions are going to remember um, what value we pick for a variable in the left term and what value we pick for a variable in the right term. Okay. And then we need to make sure that gamma belongs to G of gamma with rho and that the pair V1, V2 is related at the appropriate type tau with rho. Okay. Now, Let's give the final part of the definition here. So at the very top level, we want to say, we want to set up a logical relation which says E1 is logically related to E2 at the type tau. Here we are assuming that each one of these E's is well typed as type tau and E2 has type tau. And now we have to pick a row and a gamma substitution, close off these guys, and then say that the closed things are related in the E relation, just like we've been doing, except everything is binary. All right, so for all rho carefully picked to be in our interpretation of delta, am I writing too small? Is this okay? Back row? I guess, okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't get a yes or no. <laughs> All right. Um, and a G, sorry, a, a gamma substitution that satisfies our term environment. Uh, then if I take the substitution rho 1, so when I write rho 1 applied to some term E, I mean, I basically mean take E and substitute for all of the uh, alphas in here. Right, so if rho 1 is equal to alpha map 1 maps to tau 1, et cetera, then what I want to do here is substitute tau 1, right, tau 1 for alpha 1, uh, tau 2 for alpha 2, et cetera. Okay? That's what I mean by that notation. Apply the substitution to the term. So that's what I'm going to use. I'm going to apply the, the type substitution and the term substitution. Look at how I'm extracting the, the left-hand sides. That's what the subscript 1 means in both cases. Is that clear? Do you know what I mean by gamma 1? OK, if gamma is a substitution that maps x1 to v11 and v12, and x2 to v21 and v22, et cetera, then I'm writing gamma 1 to mean x1 maps to just extract all the values on the left to v11, x2 maps to v21, and so on. Okay? All right. So now it, it looks like a unary substitution, just like we had yesterday. So I'm going to say take that unary substitution, apply it to e1. Okay, so what am I doing here? I'm saying use the substitutions, the term substitution and the type substitution to close off your term and do the same thing on the other side. 
And these two closed terms must be related in the E relation at the type tau. And we need to give it our rho so that we can properly interpret free type variables in tau. Questions? Yes? I have a question from a while back, but I'm okay. having some trouble understanding the, the R and the, the cell. Mm -hmm. um, so what would happen, like let's say, if you, you chose as your R the empty relation? I, I guess I'm confused as to, to what it means there to be an arithmetic quantified rather than an arithmetical. Uh, okay, so. What it means is if you have a term of a polymorphic type and you want to prove something about that term, you will find yourself uh, with the power to pick any relation you like. Okay? However, when you're trying to establish that some term does in fact behave like something of polymorphic type, then you'll ha it'll be a proof obligation. You'll have to say, I just have some arbitrary R. I don't know what's in it. I have no idea. But with respect to that, I have to show that you know, the remaining conditions hold. So in particular, you're going to say, suppose that I have a tau, on a tau 2 and an arbitrary r. Again, you, now this time you'll have to treat that r as an opaque relation and establish um, whatever conditions that follow. We'll see this in an example when what we do the treatment. Just ask the, the r that's the empty relation? Uh, if you use an r that's the empty relation, you so, so let's say you're in the first scenario where I said that you have a term E of type for all alpha something, and you're trying to prove something about it. Now, you're the one picking the R that is the empty relation. It might well mean that you won't be able to prove the theorem that you're interested in. But that's okay. Right? Because you have the choice. You get to pick your own relation. Whereas in the other scenario, the empty relation is one of the possible relations that you're considering because you're considering any arbitrary relation R. But your proof must go through even if it was the em empty relation. But the empty relation is not treated specially then. So you have to work for all tau on tau 2. Yes. But, but you have to define an R? Uh, no. Uh, wait, just five minutes we're going to do a free theorem. Not five minutes. Okay, first we're going to do fundamental property, then we're going to do a free theorem, but we're going to do it today. All right, and then you'll see how we get to pick the R. It'll become much clearer. Yes? Um, so, in type theory with family intersection in classes, um, you, uh, you don't have to have these complicated logical relations just because you are dealing with the universe since you don't have this extra context of type. Um, it means like you, in the logical relations for type theory with these family intersections, you don't end up having to interpret terms that have free type variables. You don't end up having to interpret terms terms that have free type variables? Or are you saying oh, excuse me, type here, types variables. that have free type variables? Um, uh, type theory. So you're, you're talking about dependent type theory. You're talking about when we have dependent types depend on terms, right? Uh, right, right. Uh, so there you're not, um, you're not establishing parametricity in the sense of types, right? You don't have alphas. You have terms in here. Um, your types will have free term variables, but not free type variables. Correct? Uh, <laughs> in that well, setting. Uh, you you have free term variables, but it doesn't mind having some sort of necessary types. Right. Um, let's talk about this offline. Um, it, it works out, and I, yeah, but I'll need to explain this. Um, OK, so uh, all right. That is our logical relation. What we're going to prove about this logical relation is, again, of course, the fundamental property. I'm going to do one case of the fundamental property, uh, and I need to show you a critical, uh, let's use this one. OK. Um, If 
E has type tau. Then, can anyone guess what, what I'm about to write? What's the pattern you've seen over the last three days? If something is well typed, then it is in the logical relation. Yesterday I would have written, here I would have written something like with a double turnstile E colon tau, right? What am I going to write there instead today? Yes? That E is related to itself. Here is my top level relation. Notice that this has an E1, E2 because I want my logical relation to have the power to let me do proofs of equivalence of arbitrary terms. But the first property that you establish about your logical relation in order to sh show yourself and the world that you have not done anything silly um, is you show that if a term is well typed, then it is related to itself. Think of it as a reflexivity condition. But even this is pretty powerful if you think about it. Because what is going on in this definition, even though we're starting off with the same term E, look at what the definition is going to do. It's immediately going to pick different types for different inputs, right? Everything here, all of the type and term variables sitting over here are placeholders for inputs. I've been saying that, right? So immediately what that definition is going to do is it's going to say, oh, um, for all the type variables, just pick two types and give me a relation on those types. For all of the term variables, please pick related um, inputs. And once you have those, use those to close that off, right? So immediately as we close off that term on the two sides, we're going to get two very different looking programs. OK, so just want to sort of point that out. All right, that is the fundamental property of the logical relation, sort of a reflexivity kind of thing. Um, now, how do we prove this? Oh, by the way, this is also, for system F, um, this is also called parametricity. This is exactly the parametricity theorem. In many presentations, you will see it simply called parametricity. In many presentations, this entire definition here will literally be inlined into the statement of the theorem. They won't write down that short, uh, shorthand for it. OK? You will see that a lot. So I want to sort of point it out. Yes? Make the context empty? Yeah. Why? That is equivalent, yes. Right. But the lambda binders would, would then be where the, where the input sit. Exactly. So what Adam is saying, uh, for all of the type variables here, just shift them there, right? So saying, proving that statement is equivalent to proving the statement that, let's assume I just have one alpha here and one x colon tau there. So that would be, um, sorry, <laughs> lambda alpha, lambda x colon some tau dot e is related to lambda alpha, lambda x colon tau dot e at now the type. I should have made that a tau prime, but um, OK, there, <laughs> if that was tau prime. Right, so I'm saying that if we had started out with a delta that was equal to alpha and a gamma that was equal to just x colon tau, then it's just that. What are we doing? We're just shifting the inputs. That really sort of spells out the connection that's going on inside the logical relation definition with respect to inputs. In the function case and the for all case, we are picking these inputs. And notice how it is exactly the same kind of pattern that we uh, use to pick inputs when we, um, in the top level definition. This here, rho in d delta, is imposing exactly the same constraints on your relations as what's going on in the definition of for all over there. You see what I mean? In the definition of function, we pick an argument one at a time. In the definition of function, we pick related arguments for one variable. In the top level definition, we pick related arguments for all of the variables at once. But those two things do a little handshake. And they do that handshake when you do your proofs, too. If those two don't, don't line up, your proofs won't go through for the lambda case, for example. Um, and similarly for delta. Here we're picking um, two types and a relation for all of our alphas at once as part of this part of the definition, the interpretation of delta. Whereas here, we are picking them one at a time for each 
size variable out. But they have to line up. Okay? In both of those areas of the definition, we are picking good inputs or related inputs. All right. Okay, so that's related to the reason um, why I said a couple of lectures ago that you know logical relations are like a puzzle, like different pieces have to fit together. Um, and this is one of those aspects. All right. Okay, so um, now we'd like to prove the fundamental property. So you can go ahead and prove the fundamental property directly uh, simply by induction on this typing derivation. All right? But let's not do that. Let's prove, prove something slightly more general. If we prove it directly, you know that you're going to have um, one case for every single um, typing rule, correct? We'll come back to that. You need that. But um, instead of first tackling this proof, let's prove what are called compatibility lemmas. Compatibility lemmas. And I'll explain to you why we need those. OK. So you will have one compatibility lemma for every single typing rule in your language. All right? So let me show you the compatibility lemma for true. It just says true is related to true at bool. What did I do? I took the typing rule, and I did that, added that, right? Otherwise, it's just a typing rule. OK. Um, for variables, same thing. We want to prove that x is related to x at the type gamma x, whatever it might be. Now let's do something interesting. Um, for, oh, the typing rules are hidden behind. <laughs> Um, but you remember what they are, right? OK. Um, let's do, a, let me write it as a rule, just because it's easier to read. Uh, so this is, the things above the line are going to be the premises of my lemma, and below it's going to be the conclusion, right? But I'm going to write it in the style of a typing rule. Uh, so for application, we want to show that um, E1 applied to E1 prime is related to E2 applied to E2 prime at the type tau if E1 is related to E2 at a function type, uh, tau prime arrow tau, um, and the arguments E1 prime are relate, is related to E2 prime at the argument prime, tau prime. That's the compatibility lemma for application. It's just a slightly more general statement than what would happen if you just sort of, you know, started tackling this proof directly. If you started tackling that proof directly for the application case, you'd end up uh, writing down that, oh, what I need to prove is that the same thing on both sides is related. This more general statement le gives you what you want. But it also lets you prove another theorem, which will come up when we try to prove that this logical relation is sound with respect to contextual equivalence. OK? This is a standard trick. You should know it. That's, that's why I'm telling you the form of this. Right? Um, OK. So they all look kind of like that. <laughs> you have different things on the two sides whenever possible when you're dealing with arbitrary terms. Um, now let's do, let's, let's write down the one for lambda. So gamma x colon tau 1, lambda x colon, ah, let's make that a tau. Uh, tau dot e1 is related to lambda x colon tau dot e2 at the type tau arrow tau prime. Um, I'm trying to show you how these compatibility lemmas really kind of fall out from the typing rules. OK? Um, and I initially, it may look a little mysterious. Why am I changing? S why is it that sometimes I write different terms on the two sides? But see how I haven't changed the type? <laughs> oh, more basic questions? Sorry. Here? Here. Yeah? 
Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> I'll put my premise below the line. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Much more basic question. Uh, all right. So there. So if E1 is really Right, so these are lemmas, right? I'm writing them as rules to tell you what the lemma form is, right? Basically, we're trying, the, the lemma we're trying to, compatibility lemma for uh, application says that if E1 and E2 are related to the function type and E1 prime and E2 prime are related to the argument type, then the applications of those are related as the type tau. That's what you're proving, right? You should really write it as an if and else. Um, and similarly here, if the bodies of the lambdas are related in this extended environment, then the lambdas are related. Um, now let's write down um, the type application case, because uh, that's what I'd like to prove. Um, let me, in fact, just sort of dive into the case of that proof. So the compatibility for type application. This is what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove that if you have uh, delta gamma E1 applied to a tau prime, that is going to be related to an E2 applied to the same tau prime, provided that E1 is related to E2 at the polymorphic type for all alpha tau, and our tau primes are well formed under delta. Then this whole thing has type tau, uh, well, those expressions are related at tau with tau prime for alpha. OK? All right. Um, let's do this case of the proof. All right? um, there's a lemma that we're going to need, which is, where should I put it? Uh, let's put it here. Well, I'm running out of space today. I'm going to erase these compatibility lemmas and put it here. So this um, is called the compositionality lemma. Let me sort of tell you what it's about. <coughs> Say lemma. Basically, we want to prove a certain property about our type interpretation, right? And it basically looks like this. Um, that if you have a type tau that has alpha free in it, and you have another type tau prime that you want to substitute for that alpha. OK? So if you have tau with tau prime for alpha and you take its interpretation, you should get the same. That set or that relation should be equal to the relation where you just take the interpretation of tau, but with rho extended with a mapping for this alpha. And that mapping should say, OK, on the left-hand side, I'm going to substitute row 1 of tau prime. Remember, we have to close it off. On the right, I'm going to substitute row 2 of tau prime. And for the relation, I am going to pick the interpretation of this type tau prime. This is a valid R, right? This thing is a valid R that be belongs to rel of row 1 tau prime. Sorry, this is a tau prime. <laughs> row 2 tau prime. What is this lemma saying? And I'll, I'll sort of specify the other conditions about what variables are free in just a second. What this is saying is that syntactically substituting a type for alpha into tau and then interpreting it is the same as semantically substituting the type tau prime for alpha. OK? I'm reading this as semantically substituting. In other words, go take the meaning, the, interp the actual interpretation of the tau prime. And remember from now on that that's what alpha should map to. All right? Versus here, just substitute the syntax and continue from there. Those two should be equivalent, whether you syntactically substitute or semantically substitute, so to speak. Yes? 
It is a mapping from type variables to triples, um, where this is a syntactic, the first thing is a syntactic type that you, know, you will substitute for the alphas in terms inside this relation, right, but on the left. Type prime is not a type variable. I can write this differently. I could call this R if that is. Let's do this. It's less confusing. I'm going to put a mysterious R here and tell you what R is. Let R be equal to V of tau prime rho. Oh, okay, okay, all right, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, so here I'm assuming that tau prime is well formed under delta, that um, tau is well formed under delta alpha, right, because our tau has tau alpha free. Um, I'm also assuming that I have a row that satisfies my interpretation for deltas. Um, am I missing any conditions? I don't think so, I think that's it, okay? That is the compositional dilemma. This is the heart of it. <laughs> Syntactically substituting tau prime is the same as substituting, uh, as you know, carrying around the interpretation of that tau prime. Okay, we're going to need this compositionality lemma when we do the proof for type application, and that's a really, really critical part. And um, any logical relation for um, with polymorphism, you know, any system F or its extension will will uh, require that you prove a compositionality lemma like this. Okay, um, now compatibility. I have written this too big. <laughs> um, let's, let's do this proof. I will have to move this. All right, how do we prove that? What are we trying to show? Well, I copy this here. Thoughts? Trying to show the conclusion, right? Assume the top, that and that, right? Given these two facts, we're trying to prove the conclusion. All right, so if we're trying to prove the conclusion, let's unwind definitions. The definition for uh, the open logical relation is up here, or for open terms being related is, is over there. So really what it asks us to do is say, okay, suppose that we have a row and a gamma that satisfy our interpretation, right? So suppose that rho is in D delta and we have a gamma in G of gamma. Given those, we need to show that, am I writing too small, back row? No, good, okay. Uh, we need to show that rho one, gamma one of E1 tau prime is related to rho 2 gamma 2 of E2 applied to tau prime in at the result type, which is tau with tau prime for alpha. Okay? All right. So we need to show that. So, so let's just think, right? What, what do we need to show if we look at the E relation? We need to show that these two terms are going to run down to values, and those values are related in the Z interpretation of this type. That's our overall goal. All right, now let's look at what the induction hypothesis gives us. It tells us, oh, it's not induction hypothesis, sorry, from the premise, what the first premise gives us. If we instantiate this statement with a rho and a gamma, and we have a rho that we know satisfies D delta, and we have a gamma that satisfies G, uh, interpretation of gamma. So, um, from premise one, we have uh, that rho one, gamma one of E one is related to rho two, gamma two of E two, applied to E two, at E of for all alpha tau. Right? Okay. 
That statement means that this term runs down to some value. I'm just going to inline it here. All right. This term, E relation says, this, there exists a V1 such that this thing reduces to a V1, and there exists a V2 such that this thing reduces to a V2. And it tells us that V1 and V2 are related in V interpretation for all alpha tau. Right? OK. So now we have a V1 and a V2 related at V of for all alpha tau. Can you tell me what the form of those V1, V2 uh, must be? Big lambdas. Big lambdas. All right. So therefore, we're going to say let V1 be lambda alpha E1, V2 be, sorry, you can't use E1, um, E1 prime, and V2 be lambda alpha E2 prime. OK? So now we know that these two lambda alphas are related in the V interpretation of this test for all alpha tau. OK. Um, now, let's instantiate that. Let's instantiate this statement. What does it say? It says, if you can give me two types and a relation, all right? So now, we are going to instantiate that with two types and a relation. So what we're really trying to do is, you know, we've, we have our original E1 and E2. And look at what types. What types are we instantiating them with here in the top level statement? Tau prime on both sides, right? OK, here we have to pick closed types. So let's instantiate that with row 1 of tau prime for the left side, row 2 of tau prime for the right side. And the relation that we pick will, be, will just be the interpretation of tau prime. OK? By the way, before, this, before proving these compatibility lemmas, we should normally prove that all of our value interpretations of types belong to rel tau. But that's really easy to show given because all that rel requires is that your value interpretations be built out of well typed values. So it's, it's really easy. OK, so here um, I said that because now we're going to need to know that this belongs to rel of, at these two types row 1 tau prime and row 2 tau prime. OK? Those are our obligations when we instantiate something like that. It says, give me a tau 1 or tau 2 and an r and show me that that r belongs to rel of that. So I've just done that. OK. And then, what, therefore, what we get is that these e1 primes with these types substituted for alpha, so e1 prime with row 1 of tau prime for alpha is going to be related to E2 prime with row 2 tau prime substituted for alpha at tau with row extended with a mapping for our alpha. Right? And the mapping is going to be uh, exactly these three things that we picked. Row 1 tau prime, row 2 tau prime, and the interpretation of tau prime. And henceforth, let me just call this thing row prime. OK? This whole row extended with these, I'm going to call it row prime. OK? Um, so now we have this fact. What does that mean? It means that these terms run down to values, and those values are related. So this evaluates to some, um, I'll call it f for final, some final uh, vf1. This term here evaluates to some vf2. And from this statement, we know that vf1 and vf2 are related values at the type tau with this long row, which I'm writing as row prime. OK? All right. Let's step back and see what we needed to show. We needed to show that ga rho 1 gamma 1 of E1 applied to this type, which really, if we push these substitutions in, you can see that this is equivalent to rho 1 gamma 1 E1 
applied to the type rho 1 tau prime. Right? And similarly for the other side. We needed to show that those terms reduce to values and the values are related. Well, guess what? That's exactly what we've done. We've shown that the um, rho 1, gamma 1, E1 went down to these values, which are these lambdas. And then we took those lambdas, took one um, beta step for type application, stuck in exactly the right types, rho 1 tau prime and rho 2 tau prime, on the two sides. And we have managed to show, through this proof, that this term reduces to exactly this VF1, and the other one reduces to exactly this VF2. And we now know that the VF1 and VF2 are related at V of tau with an extended row. But we need to show, we needed to show that they're related at V of tau with tau prime syntactically substituted for alpha. OK, so our remaining proof obligation Remember this row prime is this long thing, right? What we need to show is the same VF1 and VF2 are related at V with tau, tau prime for alpha, rho. So we have this. We need to show this. How do you do that? Compositionality. Compositionality. Exactly. Because that's exactly that equivalent. That, that interpretation is equal to that interpretation, right there. OK? That's the proof of type application. All right. Um, now, we don't have too much time, but what I'd like to do is the proof of just one free theorem. Uh, you have your choice. Um, you can have your pick. Uh, do you want to do the proof of this? Let's do the proof of the classic free theorem, which is um, that um, if E has type for all alpha, alpha, or alpha, then it's, it's essentially it's the equivalent to the identity function. OK? Let's do that. Everyone says that, but they, you know, how to do that proof is how many people have actually done it? <laughs> OK. All right. Um, here's the free theorem that we want to prove. All right? And we call it a free theorem because it follows as a consequence of parametricity. So if E has type for all alpha, alpha or alpha, and you give me some closed type tau, and you give me a value V of type tau, then uh, I want to show that E applied to tau V will reduce to V. And this is a terminating language. I know that it will terminate, and so I can just say that when it does terminate, it's going to give me back exactly the same value. All right? If this was a non-terminating language, so if this was system F with recursive type, we would, ha we would not get such a strong free theorem. We would get a slightly weaker one. Proving it would still be essentially as we've, we're going to do it today. But the statement would be either you run this and it um, gives you a V, or it diverges. OK? That's weaker, right? Either it gives you back the value or it diverges. All right. So here's what we're proving. All right. Hmm. OK, we know that E has type for all alpha, alpha, or tau. Uh, alpha or alpha, right? We have a typing derivation for E. Therefore, by the fundamental property, oh, by the way, now, the f now after you prove all of these compatibility lemmas, the fundamental property just immediately falls out. You say the proof is by induction on this typing derivation. Every single case of the proof immediately falls from the compatibility lemma that you've already proved for that typing rule. OK? So it's literally a two-sentence proof if, you <laughs> uh, if you're writing it up. OK, so, um, so once we have the fundamental thing, we know that if E has a type, then it's related to itself. So therefore, we know by fundamental property that our E is I'm going to stop putting this here because it's a closed term. Our E is related to itself at the type for all alpha, alpha, or alpha. Right? OK. That's just by the fundamental property. All right. So what does that mean? Our E is fortunately closed. So um, when we instantiate that statement, we can pick an empty row and an empty gamma, and we'll get that E is related to itself in the E relation. Right? So we'll get from this that E is related to E at E for all alpha, alpha, or alpha, 
with an empty row. OK, now, now what? Definition of the, of the fact that we have, right, this, tells us that both of these run, evaluate to some values. OK? So let me call that f. So, I'll, so we now know that E evaluates to some value f. Maybe I should write vf, but f is a value. And we know they're both the same term, right? So they're both going to go to the same f. And we know that f is related to f in V interpretation of, for all alpha, alpha or alpha, with an empty row. Good. So now what do we know about these f's? They have to be lambda alpha something. So let f be lambda alpha e1. Right, so what we actually have is lambda alpha e1 is related to lambda alpha e1 in, at this type. Let's instantiate that. <coughs> How do we do that? We need to pick two types and a relation. Pay attention. This is where the whole proof hangs on when you pick the relation. With any free theorem, picking the relation is the part where you have to use your brain and contribute and figure out what the relation is. <laughs> All right? The rest of it is a lot of unfolding of definitions. All right. So we are now going to remember f is lambda alpha e1. So we know lambda alpha e1 is related to itself in this. So we're going to instantiate that with two types and a relation. How do you pick what those two types are? Well, you back up and you look at the statement of the theorem that you're trying to prove. You're trying to prove that the original E applied to tau something happens. So that type tau is the tau you should pick. Because, right? These E's have run down to the F's, which are now these lambdas, and we're trying to apply them to some tau. We want to apply them to the tau that's sitting up in the statement. All right, so instantiate that with tau for both sides. That one you have to kind of figure out. And what's the relation R? I'm going to use a relation R. Let R be, hmm, what is a relation R for an alpha? Right? So you have to now step back a little and think about what am I going to pass? This function is going to want an alpha there. What am I going to pass in for that alpha? Can you stare at the statement and tell me? E will want a type and then something for the alpha. We're giving it a type and then the V in the position of the alpha. So that value should belong to the V interpretation of alpha because that's how you want to run this program. So I'm going to pick this relation to simply be the singleton that relates V to V. I get to pick it. Then here I could have picked it to be empty, but then my proof won't go through. Right, that's what I meant that this is the point in the proof where you have a statement. You started out with a statement about E having a polymorphic type. In the proof, that turns into a statement about, you know, essentially that E reduces down to a value that belongs to this V interpretation of the polymorphic type. So now you get to pick the relation for that. However you might like, and this is where you need ingenuity to figure out what relation will let you push, actually prove the, th uh, the free theorem of interest. Okay? All right. So for this, we're going to pick the, rel the singleton relation that relates V to itself. Uh, so once we've instantiated that uh, with these three things, uh, notice that V does have type tau, right? So clearly this R is in rel of these two types, which is important to establish, right? Because our definition demands it. Um, therefore, what do we get? We get that this E1, remember we have lambda alpha E1 on both sides, E1 with tau for alpha is related to E1 with tau for alpha. This is kind of boring because it always, for, this is such a simple free theorem, it always remains identical on both sides. Okay, um, is related at the type, this type, alpha or alpha. And this time our empty row gets extended with this mapping. Alpha maps to tau tau r. 
Okay? So we have this fact. We know that these things are related at um, alpha or alpha's terms. That tells us that each of these terms reduces to some value. Let me call that value g. It's going to be a function, right? Um, so we know e1 with tau for alpha reduces to some g. And g is related to g in V of alpha or alpha. Now that's a function type. We have to go look at the function definition. Um, OK. Again, this is a fact we have, so we're going to use the fact. How can we use the fact? Well, the function definition says, OK, you have two lambdas. Oh, by the way, let's note that g must be a lambda x dot something, right? So um, note g must be a lambda. So we're going to say um, let g equal lambda x colon tau dot e2. OK? Therefore, what we really have is that lambda x colon tau dot e2 is related to itself. The g's are the same at this type, alpha or alpha. OK. So instantiate that with what? We need to apply our functions to some argument. These functions are alpha or alpha functions. Focus on this part. What argument do we want to provide right there to a function of this type? A v, right? Actually, we don't really have a choice. <laughs> Look at what the definition says. It says we have these two lambdas. They're related at alpha arrow alpha. What does that mean? It says, give me an argument, please, or give me two related arguments that are related at v of alpha. What is related at v of alpha? V and v. Because v of alpha is whatever is sitting um, in this, you know, is going to relate the values that are in the relation that we picked for alpha. Right? This is the relation we picked for alpha, v and v. So we're going to instantiate that with two arguments, v and v. <laughs> right? And note that v is related to v at v of alpha. in this extended environment, right? And this whole thing, v of alpha in this extended environment, is just nothing but r. v is related to v and r, because that's the r we picked. OK, so now that we have provided it with, with two arguments that are related at alpha, that conveniently came from our relation, we get back that the bodies of the lambdas, e2 with v for x, is related to e2 with v for x, at the results type, which is also alpha. Right? OK. So since we have that, that means that this term, e2 with v for x, reduces down to some final value vf, both of them are going to reduce to the same vf, right? And from the statement, we know that vf is related to vf, f for final, at v alpha extended v of alpha with this is just the relation r, correct? I'm going to erase it. V of alpha, all of that, is just the relation R. So now we know that Vf is related to Vf in R. Therefore, Vf is equal to what? V. There's nothing else in R. Look at R. Therefore, Vf is equal to V. All right. Now, let's collect our thoughts and see what we have done. Um, What we have done is we have started out here with the e's, right? Started out with e tau 
v, I claim, we took some number of steps to reduce the e to an f. So we got to this. It's up on the board. I'm just collecting my facts from the board. Then we said, oh, that f has to be a lambda alpha dot e1. Then we said, oh, that lambda alpha, we can take one step and apply it to the tau. So in one step, we got to e1 with tau for alpha. Then we said, e1 with tau for alpha reduces to g. So we got that. Then we said that g must be lambda x colon tau dot e2. So we have that. Then we said do a beta reduction step, e2 with v for x. And then we said e2 with v for x reduces to vf. And then we said that that is equal to v. So what have we just proved? that E applied to tau V reduces to V. <laughs> okay, some people are smiling, but yeah, that's, that's, one of, that's the simplest free theorem you can show and it, even that is kind of involved. Um, so what was the magic here? That singleton relation that we picked was the magic, right? Um, because See, the idea here is that whatever relation you pick must be preserved by, um, by the logical relation. It must be preserved as you um, run through your program, so to speak, right? And you'll see how when we got to this point where we had functions at alpha or alpha, we were forced to feed in a particular argument, the v's, right? Um, and much more importantly, what fell out is that after you applied the lambdas to those v's, the only thing you could get back had to be an r. So it had to be a v. Right? So that choice of r was critical. And then you, it's because it's the combination of picking that r and then being forced to say, hey, I need an alpha here. Uh, how do I figure out what things are related at alpha? Well, I have to go look in the relation that someone picked. OK. Yes, Adam. Oh, yes, yes, you're right. <laughs> the empty type. For all alpha, alpha is empty, right? There, there, uh, that, uh, that type is uninhabited. There are no terms of that type. Yes, we could prove that. Um, OK, we should uh, stop now for lunch. Um, let, me, um, let me put up an exercise on the board, a free theorem, all right, for this afternoon. Uh, this is an interesting one, and I'll be around. You can come ask me uh, how it goes. Um, what, um, so here it is. Put it up. Or I'll put it up here and you guys can look at it and, um, actually no, give me, give me two minutes. Let's put it up because it's uh, at least intuitively why it's uh, a valid free theorem is, is interesting. Um, so, um, theorem. If I have a term uh, E of type for all alpha, tau arrow alpha, arrow alpha. OK? And I have, uh, let me call it k. k should remind you of continuation. If I have a k which has type tau arrow sum tau k, then if I take this function, essentially, and apply it to the type uh, tau k and then pass in k, what's the type of this? Plugging in tau k for this, and then uh, supplying this, so I get back something that is of type tau k, right? That is going to be equivalent to if you take e, apply it to just tau, and pass in the identity function, I can just write id there, and then pass the result to that continuation k. These two should be equivalent at the type tau k. Notice that this term gives you back something of type tau, but then k applied to something of type tau gives you something of tau, type tau k. 
So they both do have the same type on both sides. That free theorem, okay? This, uh, this theorem is called the parametricity condition. Actually, it's a slightly simplified version of the parametricity condition that appears in uh, Phil Wadler's paper, Theorems for Free, right? It's a slightly simplified version because there he uh, doesn't just have identity here, he has a composition of functions, but, but this is a little easier, all right? So try proving that today. Um, and coming up with the relation R is the interesting bit. All right, okay. And tomorrow I'll do a survey um, to kind of close off. Um, I'll, I'll talk for about 20 minutes about uh, how we do um, log you know, uh, binary relations in the presence of non-termination, and then I'll, I'll do a survey to sort of give you a sense of what are all of the applications of uh, logical relations. And you can use that slide deck as a reference for papers that are out there. Okay.